And okay, so uh, for anybody uh, that uh, does not wish to be on camera, feel free to, to take you off screen, but we'd love to have you on screen um, if you're okay with that on the recording end of things. <clears throat> and uh, we're, we're just over three minutes past the hour. So let's get moving uh, with this session. And uh, this is the next installment of our virtual seminar series. I want to thank everybody that uh, contributes in putting this on. It's been phenomenal. Um, we, I love that it's a constant in the organization and uh, it brings so many fresh topics to the table here. So on my end of things, um, I do just want to take a moment to share with you two opportunities that we do have coming up Then I'm going to hand it off. We have our much anticipated conference coming up in Thessaloniki, Greece. That is from July 9th through 12th. The call for papers is open right now. The, uh, the deadline is in early February. So you have more than enough time to submit your papers, but we'd love for you to submit and join us in Greece at the Macedonia Palace Hotel. Uh, and then second, we have uh, a recently our 15-4 issue of NCMR, Negotiation and Conflict Management Research Journal. And that was recently uh, published. Um, by all means, please do go to the chat box there and check out the links that I've posted so you can read those most recent articles of NCMR and other ones on our homepage that are online first. So at this time, I'm going to hand it off to Michelle. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for joining and uh, for whatever discussion comes about. And uh, I wish you a wonderful session. Thank you, Brendan. And I'm very proud to um, have a conversation today with Professor Gigerenzer. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. My name is Michel Mann. I'm a researcher at the Leuphana University in Germany. And in today's session of the ISDM virtual seminar series, we will learn from Professor uh, Gerd Gigerenzer um, how to make smart decisions in a <clears throat> smart world. We all know uh, we have smartphones, we have lots of uh, technical devices, but yeah, how uh, should we handle them and how should we stay smart? Let me introduce um, Professor Gigerenzer briefly. Um, he is the director of the Harding Center for Risk Competence at the University of Potsdam, Germany. It's um, near Berlin. He is the founder and shareholder of Simply Rational. It is an organization that offers consultation and training uh, to empower people to make better decisions. And he is also a former director at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, Berlin and a professor of psychology uh, at the University of Chicago. He is the author of uh, several books and I'd like to share one of them. Um, you can see it in the chat. It's how to stay smart uh, in a smart world, but he also has written uh, very fascinating books about risk, uh, risk savvy, how to make good decisions or gut feelings. I really enjoyed that in my uh, summer holiday, how um, you can make intelligent uh, decisions based on the unconscious. So um, yeah, final comment, according to the Gottlieb uh, Dudweiler Institute, he is among the top 100 most influential thinkers in the world. And to get it started, Professor Gigerenzer, is there anything I forgot about uh, uh, to mention about you as a person? <laughs> I think you did a great job. <laughs> and uh, Thank you. Uh, I think the, the only thing is that you might be interesting. I had a, an earlier career. I was a musician. Mm -hmm. OK. What instrument did you play? Now, everything where I could finance my studies. So mostly, so you, you can. Uh, I go into the internet and type in my name and VW Golf, so Volkswagen Golf. Yeah? So uh, at that time I had a band and uh, we uh, won a contest and we did the first TV advertisement for this car. Great. And I'm the, I'm the guy on the banjo. Okay. <laughs> it's some time ago, you won't necessarily uh, <laughs> Easily, I will I have to check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, um, just to uh, give you a short overview uh, about the session, we will have a short conversation, let's say 30 minutes. I will raise some questions. I will try to ask really smart questions, but I, I'm not sure if I'm uh, capable, but I'm quite <laughs> sure that Professor Gigerenzer will uh, provide very smart answers. And after these uh, 30 minutes, uh, you are all, um, um, you can all raise your questions by using the chat function or uh, in person. If you want to um, uh, raise a question, please use the hand, uh, raise your hand button, and then we will proceed um, according to um, the 
yeah, to, uh, to the, um, I don't know the word in, in English, to the, to the, the rank or the sort of um, a purist. So uh, let's get it started. I'd like to open the, um, the discussion um, about a question, um, how your research focus, Professor Gigenze, uh, developed. Because as a younger uh, researcher or scholar or somebody who is in the middle of his career, it's quite interesting to understand how this uh, was happening. Is it more by surprise, by chance, or was it a strict <laughs> plan? Maybe you can provide <laughs> us with some insights. No, uh, there was no strict plan. And actually, if you do an academic career, it might be foolish to have a strict plan, like a five-year plan, because you still don't understand. And if you have a strict plan, you're not open to new ideas. So my own life started with getting interested in decision-making, and in particular, in uh, statistics in general. So the taming of uncertainty and uh, uh, the, and that also made it very clear to me what statistics can do and what it can't do. And so I got interested in uh, the way humans solve problems that statistics can't do. And that's done with heuristics. So rules of thumb that are often social. So I'll try to find out what you want to hear and I tell it to you. Right. Or I follow uh, the, uh, I imitate others. And actually, if you look closely, these heuristics are on the basis of our culture, our evolution. For instance, if there would be no imitation, then every child had to start from the beginning and there would be no culture. So I have had very folk, many focuses and one thing I learned that there is no tool that can do everything. And here we have the, the, the direct connection to uh, how people think about AI. And some think it's now the tool that can do everything. And that's a big misunderstanding. Okay, if we uh, have a look into your new book, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can see it, yeah. I guess, how to stay smart in a smart world. Um, you get uh, quite soon um, the impression that you are rather hesitant uh, with regard to the chances and opportunities that AI can offer to humankind. Um, uh, why is it that you're so hesitant? You just mentioned no tool can do everything. But um, you're rather skeptical. It's my uh, impression. Um, uh, I wouldn't see that in that way. Uh, I'm interested in what uh, AI, including the digital world, can do. And we couldn't have this conversation today without it. I couldn't do my research. What I'm skeptical of is, is marketing hype and techno-religious faith mm, to the point that some people think the best of all world would be if there would be super intelligence hmm, that tells us what we should do, whom we should marry, for whom we should vote. And you can find these visions both in prominent people in Google and also in prominent bestsellers, hmm, authors. So my interest is a scientific one. What can AI do, what it cannot do? And, and also what human intelligence can do. And I would consider that as a positive view to, to uh, make clear uh, the things that human intuition, human intelligence and understanding can do. And I consider uh, the various versions of AI as a support uh, to it. So does that help? Hmm? That, that helps, definitely. <laughs> it it uh, sorts um, some kind of thoughts that uh, come, came up to my mind. Um, when we are talking about negotiation and, and management, which yeah. is our focus here in, in that group or conflict yeah. management, um, what do you think? How could AI help us as negotiators or conflict managers to make better decisions and um, yeah, come to better outcomes 
than uh, without using AI. Yeah. So the first thing um, to understand is that, uh, so AI is many things. Huh? So let's talk about complex algorithms such as deep neural networks or uh, machine learning and these things. So these techniques work wonderful in a stable world. So the big successes of AI were with chess, Go, industry applications, and other situations which are well-defined and don't change in unexpected ways. In this world, uh, the, you, the best thing you can do is just uh, use some kind of AI. And uh, if you administrate data, huh, that's, that's a great idea. When, however, you want to use complex algorithms uh, in situations that are ill-defined, that are not stable, uh, which is typically characteristic for human behavior or the behavior of viruses like corona or the flu, then big data and complex algorithms won't help you. And here you need either uh, what I have been studying, heuristics that realizes our algorithms that just rely on the one or the few most important things, and also human understanding and intuition. That's a short answer to your question. <laughs> yes, but a very important one. And I'm just thinking about my comprehension of negotiation is more an ill-defined um, um, yeah. situation yeah. Um, where you cannot really make good um, predictions of what will happen because on yeah. the other side of the table, yeah. there is somebody who is all, also thinking about what to do. Um, is there any chance to, to use AI in that complex um, decision-making context? Because I'm thinking about, are there any mm -hmm. uh, negotiations which, which are very standard, uh, maybe yeah. uh, procurement decisions that you take every day? I'm yeah. not sure. So uh, you can use AI in order to find data for as a basis of your negotiations and, and for analyzing the data. But then when it comes to deal with other people, you better use your own understanding and your own intel intelligence and just think about what it would be if, in, if you could delegate all of these uh, decisions to a machine so what's then? Yes, we delegate responsibility, but the decisions won't get better. And also, uh, yeah, the negotiations would be dispensable. So it's very clear to, to understand what AI can do. If you're in a stable world, then trust it. If you're in an uncertain world, don't. Just to give you one, one example, uh, remember IBM's Watson. Watson did a, an unexpectedly marvelous job in a, in a game, Jeopardy, where the machine beat the best human players. Then IBM's, IBM's CEO, Gini Rometti, announced the moonshot. Now Watson will revolutionize medicine, everything from drug development to cancer therapy. And that is now not a well-defined problem. And you could, by the, just by thinking we, in terms of the stable world principle, you could already uh, expect that it won't work. But, um, so uh, quite many clinics all over the world bought the advice for Watson for cancer uh, therapy. And for instance, NH Anderson in the US, a well-known and high reputation clinic, uh, spent 62 million before they noticed that Watson was endangering their patients and couldn't do the job and, and fired it 
uh, and uh, IBM then said, oh, yeah, Watson is at the level of a first year medical student, the best paid first year medical student ever. This is a problem and a high uncertainty. And here you need human intelligence and training and not a machine. And by the way, today, as of now, Watson is being sold in parts, including most likely the patient data to equity first. So here you have the same idea. So it's one and the same type of machine. It can do some problems spectacularly. They are well-defined and games. And it can do other problems. And that's important to understand and not to spend 62 millions on a so, first year graduate student. Yeah. So, so what I take um, for, for negotiation would be maybe in preparation and supportive functions, mm -hmm. AI could deliver mm -hmm. great supportive um, um, benefits. But when it comes to the interaction at the table, uh, we should more rely on, um, on human decision making on yeah. our heuristics. And um, when we have a look into, the, in, into your book, um, there are some heuristics that you mentioned that uh, could help to improve our decision making. Uh, when you think about negotiation, let's say leadership, let's say conflict resolution, what kind of heuristics could that be that managers uh, should rely more on in order to make better decisions? So uh, the, the textbook folklore is that heuristics make negotiators biased. That's what you are being told in business schools. And what you should do is some kind of expected utility maximization. Now, the, I say this in front, uh, you can't do uh, maximization or optimization in an uncertain world by definition, because you don't know all outcomes. So you can't do a probability distribution. So the heuristics that can be useful in negotiations. And uh, so one way is uh, to, to study what successful uh, negotiators do. And there are many proposals about that. Huh? Uh, the, uh, so uh, it, it depends on the initial statements. So if you have a simple negotiation of a, of a price, huh? And uh, we know things that skilled negotiators ask questions more than twice as often as average negotiators. And there is a, and there are a number of heuristics like satisfying that can help you. Like set an aspiration level, but keep it secret. And a minimum a, a reservation level. Anyhow, uh, it's, it's more than calculation. And AI can help you, for instance, to find out what the other side has agreed in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, you are discussing the, the less is more principle. And you, I, I'm not sure if we uh, already discussed it here, but maybe up front. Um, but you um, said with regard to, to sports, Sometimes the first ish intuition is, is the best, and yeah. it might be interesting to rely on a single criteria. Is that something which is also important in, in management? Yes. <clears throat> so the less is more principle means that there are situations where uh, decisions with less time and less information can be superior to decisions with more time and more information. I gave you an example at the beginning about the fluency heuristic. So uh, people experience in sports, so uh, ball players, for instance, that have to make a decision, which option to play. Uh, they, uh, are well advised to follow the first impulse, so the first option to come to their mind. And a number of this, uh, uh, studies in sports show that, and it's basically 
the order in which options come to mind is the best one, is the most likely to come first, the second one, the, the second likely, and so on. And that only holds for uh, skilled players, not for novices. So that means uh, if you give a skilled player only little time, the person is likely to make better decisions because the lesser options don't even come to his or her mind. So that's a situation where we can understand that less time is better and studies show that. And the, maybe the, the most, um, and also you can actually uh, in sports, you can uh, uh, make the decisions of the other side worse by making them think about what they're doing. So the, probably the most famous case is, remember, since we now have a world championship, huh? so there was one in 2006, and Argentina played Germany. And, the, and it was uh, a draw, and it went into penalty shooting, everything which captures the emotions of everyone. And it was an unusual shooting because the German goalie, Jens Lehmann, uh, had a sheet of paper in his hand standing in the middle of the goal and uh, in, in studying it. Now assume you are an Argentinian player and you put your uh, the ball on the penalty point uh, and then you go back and then you see the goalie has a sheet of paper that's studying what's on it. Uh, and you guess probably rightly statistical information about where I'm shooting, maybe often left uh, uh, up. And then you think, what should I do now? And that's exactly the point. And Jens Lehmann held uh, uh, the, uh, two penalty shoots and Germany went on and Argentina went home. Now I've talked with specialists in, um, in, in soccer and they sometimes believe that, it's a, that it was the information on the sheet. But the studies show, no, it's not. It is actually, you uh, try to disturb the intuition of an excellent expert by making him think. And in this case, the evidence is clear because for instance, for the last Argentinian player, and you can see the scene still in the internet, Jens Lehmann, was standing in the middle of the goal and studying and studying and studying. And there was nothing about this player on the sheet, which is found out later. So what I'm saying here is, uh, yes, excellent people can do decisions faster and better at the same time, contrary to what's often said. And there's a way to disturb these intuitions by making them take more time and think. Thank you very much. Uh, great, great example. There's a question from Ray. Uh, is there ever a problem with pe people thinking they are experts but are not? Maybe Ray, you, you want to uh, say something else <laughs> to the question? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just noticed this, this um, distinction between expert and non-expert. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but then, if you were going to give advice, that would be that makes a lot of sense. But then many people assume might some people might assume they're expert more yeah, yeah. than they deserve to be. Or some people might be lack confidence and presume yeah. that they're not expert when they, in fact, are. Yeah, that's true. So your point is well taken. So uh, you can define an expert as someone who can do a job considered substantially better than a novice. And by that criteria, you can eliminate a number of people who advise you in stock picking. You can eliminate a number of people who do astrology or other kind of things. They may say they are experts, but you can show they aren't. So that's said. And 
an ex you become an expert if you have long experience with a certain domain. And then you develop an intuition about that. And often one needs to practice deliberately first, like playing the piano. You start with your finger and learn where to put them. But music only starts if you do not know anymore what your finger is or doing. So that's a way how deliberate practice turns into intuition. So and that's one way to identify an expert. So if our teaching kind of provides models for, for students, uh, and maybe they're executive students who are experienced and, 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 and we're trying to say, we'll sometimes say, well, uh, I kind of knew this before, but your teaching helps us think about it, understand structurally what's really going on. Yeah. Um, but maybe that ruins it for them. Maybe that like switch towards cognitive understanding totally undermines them instead of helps yeah. them. And it, it's, it's interesting. So expertise is both intuitive, but also deliberate. I think it's an error to make an opposition between intuition and deliberation. That's, that's, for instance, uh, Einstein once said you know, that the, uh, his theories would have never developed without his intuition. At the same time, he was checking his theories by analytics, by mathematics. And so the uh, intuition, meaning lots of experience, you do something, but you cannot explain why, and deliberation, they go together. So there are dual system theories in psychology, which make this polarization and often also put deliberation on top over and think that it, intuition is the source of all errors. That is not my thinking. And there is no evidence for that. It's very popular. It's just like if you, if you just, um, if you've ever studied the, the history of intelligence, you will find that the same kind of opposition between fast and slow huh? and intuitive and deliberate and associative and reflective has been used in the into the 20th century to distinguish the, th the thinking, the nature of female intuition and male reason. The same dichotomy was there and it's now back. It is a non-starter. Like nature and nurture, they're not oppositions, they go together. Great, so uh, I will share an, an article um, of yours, Professor Gegenwinster, it's uh, the review article. Maybe someone is interested in um, uh, checking um, the aspects that we covered so far. I'd like to, to open the, the Q&A session by raising a question, which is um, referring to your, your article on bias bias. I just yeah. had mm -hmm. some problems mm -hmm. in understanding what you mean, but maybe yeah. um, you can, can describe for the audience what you mean with bias bias. Okay. <clears throat> so there is one prominent uh, stream in psychology and also in uh, behavioral economics that compares human judgment to the rules of logic and probability and then finds human judgment wanting and concludes it's a cognitive bias and and the literature is full particularly management literature full with bias it's overconfidence uh, base rate neglect the linda problem and and framing and other things. Uh, this is not my view of the matter because uh, logic and probability theory only gives you the right answer in what Jimmy Savage called a small world where everything is known, all alternatives, all the consequences, including the probabilities. Most of the time, particularly if you're in negotiation, you have to do with uncertainty and in uncertainty, logic and probability theory only gets you a little. And the rest is 
something else. So the bias bias is a tendency uh, based on this kind of paradigms to see biases, even if there are none, or to see systematic errors, even if they're only unsystematic ones. And maybe I'll explain it with one, one uh, famous example, framing. So according to, to uh, uh, dear colleagues of mine, like Danny Kahneman, Amos Tversky, um, uh, Dick Saylor, Keith Sunstein, and many others, framing is called uh, an error because logically uh, equivalent formulations of the same uh, information should be treated the same. So assume, uh, I take a, a key example from uh, Thaler and Sunstein's nudging book and framing is also then one of the motivations for to nudge people uh, of this kind of paternalism. So, uh, assume you have a severe heart condition and you consider a dangerous operation. And you ask your doctor, what's the prospect? And the doctor tells you, you have a 90% chance to survive. So you might think, okay, do it. Or the doctor tells you, you have a 10% chance to die. And then you might think differently. According to the logical way of rationality, this frame, 90% survive or 10% die, should not matter for you. You should not have your preference depend on that. That's the message. And this is why framing them is biased. Huh? And most people in this situation are, according to this measure, biased. Now think a moment. This is not a situation where all the information is known on the table. It's a situation of high uncertainty. And experiments show that if you put doctors or just graduate students in the, uh, and give them the information, uh, that the, um, <clears throat> the side effects, for instance, of these uh, operations are severe, and there is nothing of the side effects in that, hmm? then they will choose the 10% message, so the negative frame. If the doctors know that there are no severe side effects, they will choose the 90%. So the positive frame. And most important, not only people choose the frame to convey information that's not being explicitly said, but also on the other side, patients understand as a number of studies have shown. The short thing is uh, framing, attending to framing in such a situation is a sign of human intelligence. And actually, it can save your life. And thinking logically is dangerous and not intelligent. So that's a case of a bias bias, yeah? that researchers, smart researchers, see biases where there aren't any, because they think that rationality can be described by logic alone, and there's nothing else. And that's a big misunderstanding. I will post this article. I think yeah. it's from 2018. So um, 18, yeah. you so find I, a number of mm -hmm. examples there. Some of this may puzzle you more. For instance, the hot hand fallacy is not a fallacy at all. And there is no reason why coaches should get that wrong. It's a fallacy in the, in the thinking of the researchers. And there is also a kind of tendency that uh, that I've seen often researchers that have not really a good statistical education hmm, diagnose statistical errors in others more often than those who have a good statistical education. Yeah, are there any questions from the audience who wants to 
raise a question, use the raise your hands button or the chat. We have around mm. eight to 10 minutes left. And I don't want the, to be the only one who is <laughs> raising questions <Yeah. laughs> because I'm running out of smart questions. <laughs> Anyone who wants to raise a question, if not, I will proceed because I have a, a list of, of questions, but interrupt me. Um, I, I'd like to um, uh, yeah, ask a further question with regard to framing, because uh, framing, I understand. And if you read the article, uh, the bias bias, you will see, okay, it could be a problem um, in the society. If we think about the government who nudges people to do X or, or Epsilon, um, but I, if I'm thinking about negotiation, I'm rather convinced that framing is not a bad idea, but maybe I'm wrong. What do you think yeah. about framing in, in that context or in leadership followership, <clears throat> follow well, interactions? All of our use of natural language is framing. There are typically two words for the same thing and they convey different valuations. Or the way you express something is is uh, a message. So for instance, in the doctor's example, if you live in the US, where as a doctor, you know that there's a litigation culture and you pay tons of money yeah, for your insurance, you also know that you should not uh, always hmm, convey explicitly an advice because if something goes wrong, there might be a law, lawyer around the corner. And here, uh, there is an implicit way to, to convey some information. And that's very general in language. We do it all the time and people understand. And that's the same thing in, in uh, things like bargaining, negotiations, and, and they are used and they the one can use framing to influence other people huh? and, uh, positively. So to let them something know without saying it explicitly, but then also can try to mislead people. That's like with everyone, but it would be a misunderstanding that you could understand negotiations or language by just looking at the logical relations or at uh, the probabilistic and numbers. Thank you. Yeah, there's a question from Cynthia Wang. Um, I just read it out loud. Can you speak more about how culture influences the use of specific heuristics? Are there certain cultures in which deliberate uh, strategies yeah. are more <clears throat> ecologically rational than intuitive strategies? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. And there's too little research on that, but there's some. So we, uh, <clears throat> we do have cultures where um, deliberation alone counts and intuition is looked down. You find this uh, a little bit more in certain Western cultures, but also within a culture, you find a certain kind of anxiety of admitting an intuitive decisions more often in large corporations than in family-run businesses. So for instance, uh, I have worked with large corporations uh, that, and asked confidentially the, uh, the top executives how often an important business decision is at the end a gut decision, that's their term. That means you go through all the data and all the data, but sometimes the data doesn't answer you, doesn't tell you what you just decide. And then you feel that you shouldn't do this or you should do this. That's what's meant. Again, it's not an opposition, it's both. You go through the data and if the data doesn't give you, you do intuitive. The typically, do you want to guess what uh, large firms on the international stock markets, uh, what their executives say, what proportion of their 
important decision, like whether they would go to Taiwan and, um, and, and open up a new factory there, is at the end a gut decision. So what do you think? Is it 1% or 2% or 5 or 10? The answer is, it's about 50%. And that's their own admission. But they would, at the same time, they would never, ever dare to make this public because they are afraid. And rightly so, because if you would say, I looked at all the data and it was inclusive. And now I, I, I sensed we shouldn't do that. That wouldn't count in much of our society. It would count in a family business, but it's, but it's their own money. But for a manager, it's not their money. So they protect themselves. And I've seen two ways to protect themselves. One is to, uh, uh, to ask an employee, to find reasons after the fact for the already made gut decisions. And a week later, the decision is presented as a fact-based, uh, maybe big data-based decision, and uh, which is a waste of time, waste of money, and waste of intelligence. The more expensive version of that is one hires a consulting firm that then hmm, uh, with a 200 page document justifies the already made gut decisions after the fact. I've worked with large consulting firms and asked the uh, principals, are you willing to tell me how many of your business contacts involve justifying already made decisions? And a principal of one of the largest consulting firms told me, said, Professor Gigeron, so you don't mention my name, I tell you. He did this over dinner. It's more than 50%. So you see, uh, the general point is anxiety about responsibility and intuitive decisions require responsibility because it's you. Hmm? This anxiety costs companies tons of money time to make decisions they're slow and also uh, wastes intelligence rather than to study how professional uh, soccer players or professional fire officers make decisions successfully yeah with intuition in this area there is fear anxiety and waste of money. Yeah, there are two more questions in the chat. Uh, one from Jane. What do you think of the Jonathan Haidt's theory, theories of intuitive moral reasoning seems consistent with, with what you are saying? Good observation. Uh, it is to a large degree consistent. What I do not share is, so he's in a fight with, with the others who think that moral reasoning is what counts. And here uh, is moral intuition. I don't see these as contradictions, just in regular decision, you need both. You need to think about what you're doing or what your values, but, but also uh, much of, um, in a descriptive way, much of what we value has never been decided by us. We just, yeah, intuitively find that right and wrong. What also interests me more, uh, so Jonathan Haidt takes intuition as a kind of primitive. I try to explain it. And the explanation of these heuristics, like imitation yeah, or tit for tat. Do what others do. Which also explained in moral inconsistencies. So if you have a teenager that goes by the heuristic, uh, do whatever my peers are doing, then it depends on the peer group. If the peer, if he is lucky and the peer group is a good one. So that teenager will tone up amazingly things, maybe for society, 
But if he's unlucky and the peer group is out for troubles, then it goes in the other direction. And that's why we have to think about the interaction between mind, here heuristics, and environment. And that's often called moral luck. So where, where are you actually, in what environment you were born in, or you found, created yourself? Yeah, good question. Maybe a final question, uh, if I may. Can you elaborate more about specific situations in which overthinking can be helpful, raised by Jimena Ramirez? So the question is when overthinking Overthinking, can... helpful. Helpful. Yeah, helpful. We discussed so, when it uh, is harm harmful, but now it's interest yeah, we're interested okay. in yeah. understanding when okay. it's helpful. It's a, it's a good question. And in general, the, um, the point is what I call ecological rationality. Point is nothing is good or bad or successful per se, but you need to look at the environment. And that's exactly the type of question here. So uh, in, in situations where things change quickly, and uh, also in situations where, where my book, How to Stay Smart in a Smart World is. So the creation of this smart world, here thinking can be quite helpful. So for instance, you, if you had to wait uh, a long time on a, a service hotline, you might think why? And it could be that an algorithm inferred from your zip code or from your address that you have a low customer value. Or, so here thinking helps, yeah? or uh, assume you are, it's Saturday evening, you're in bed with your partner and you watch TV. And on the next morning, you get on your iPhone advertisement for Viagra and also medication. Why? That's a good time to think. The, it might be that you bought a smart TV and you didn't read the privacy policy. So if you, uh, Samsung, Samsung had its, in its privacy policy, the following statement, do not conduct personal, uh, a conversations in front of the TV because everything is recorded together with everything else yeah? and sent on to third parties for analysis. So these are all examples where in a smart world where now everything is changing, it pays to think through. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gigainza. Um, I think we are now close to the end. Uh, it's time to really say uh, thank you for your time. We are really um, honored to have you as a, a speaker here today. Um, thank you very much. And I would also like to thank all the participants, um, not only today, but in our entire series. We wish you all um, a nice Christmas. Um, yeah. Have a good time and see you soon in one of our future sessions. All the best. Thank you very Bye -bye. much, everybody. Hope to see you in Greece. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Professor Gigerenzer, vielen, vielen Dank. Ja, bitte. War mir eine Ehre. Wir haben ja einen sehr breiten Bogen angesprochen heute. Ja? Das stimmt, das ja. stimmt. Genau. Ich habe versucht, gut, ein ja. bisschen was abzudecken. Ja. <lacht> Aber war sehr kurzweilig, hat Spaß gemacht. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. All the best, mm -hmm. everyone. Stay yes, healthy. Thank you. Take care. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. you too. Bye bye.